Hi, I'm Chris Giamo. And at TD Bank, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important financial issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by New Jersey Resources, Berkeley College, United Airlines, Hackensack Meridian Health, the Fidelco Group, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, and by NJM Insurance Group. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. And by Commerce Magazine. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome, folks. I'm Steve Adubato. We're here at the North Ward Center in Newark, New Jersey. We've just completed a very compelling, powerful, and frankly, very candid conversation about the future of urban education and uh, young lady you're about to see on camera, Michelle Adubato, the chief executive officer of the North Ward Center, uh, was not just a big part of that forum of nine experts in urban education, but invited us here to the center um, where our dad started this organization 45 years ago, an urban educator. Yes. Um, biggest takeaway for you from that discussion was, is? You know, I, I came into this knowing that there was a long road ahead. When, after the conversation that we had, although we, we continue to understand that Newark is nowhere near it needs to be in terms of education for everybody, that there's real hope. It's, it's, uh, it's tangible. By the way, as we're doing this program, Newark is transitioning from state control, some say a takeover over the last 20 plus years, to local control. That matters because? It matters because like every other town, Newark should have a right, Newark parents and families should have a right to be a part of their educational system. It happens all across the, you know, America. Why wouldn't it happen here? But as a, I said in the forum that you're a former principal, but you also made it clear once a principal, always a principal. But to those watching right now outside of urban areas, outside of Newark or Jersey City, Camden, Patterson, Plainfield, et cetera, New Brunswick, what would you say to those folks about who these young people are in the city of Newark and in urban schools across the state and nation? I'd say that these kids are eager, willing, and want to learn. If they're given the right structure, the right format, the right school, the right culture of excellence, all of them will perform. They just don't have, not every student has that chance right now. Why do you think so many have so few, so low expectations of children in schools in our cities? I don't know if everyone has low expectations. I didn't say everyone, there's... but there are a significant number of people watching right now and across this nation who don't expect much. You do. Because I know them. I know these kids. Um, I've been in Newark Public Schools, like I said, for over 25 years. I'm in the community all the time as the CEO of the North Ward Center. And these kids, the preschools, over 700 preschoolers, ABBA preschoolers here, at the, vibrant, North at the North Ward Center. What do you see in them? I see hope. I see they're ready to go. They're ready to enter first grade. They're, they're reading above grade level, their comprehension. And I also see energy. The, the pause that I have, because I'm not going to sit here and say that everything's rosy because it absolutely isn't. The pause that I have is when they enter into first grade reading above average, will that continue? You know, well, why, why, why does it give you because pause? Not, because not all schools are, are equal, unfortunately. And so when our kids do go into their respective schools, that, you know, will there be, uh, you know, the opportunity to continue to grow? And in Newark, there are what we call pockets of excellence. We like to say pockets what is of the, excellence. What do you think? It's a euphemism for what? It's a <laughs> euphemism for not all schools are doing well, you know, and Is that's it camouflaging true. some of the problems? Absolutely. 
because I don't accept pockets of excellence. Um, I accept that, you know, I expect, and, and everyone in that room also, we expect that every child should be able to get a You're quality education. Form. Absolutely. Yeah, but by the way, what is the role of an organization like the North Ward Center, been around for over 40 years, social service organization, if you will, mm -hmm. in the future of public school children in the city of Newark? Why, why is a, a not-for-profit so committed to this initiative? This is the part of who we are as a community. Um, we can talk about funding and money. There's never enough money to go around. And of course, you know, Nork um, as a whole needs uh, more revenue. If, this, if the community-based organizations don't take their responsibility correctly and help Nork Public Schools, then we have no business being Define here in Nork. Give us a couple of examples. Help, support, advocate. Um, Nork, uh, I go around to every school in this area. Uh, we sponsored uh, Thanksgiving dinners. Uh, we have different events here. Um, with Robert Treat Academy, we've worked. Robert Treat Academy Robert is Treat the charter Academy. school that was founded by our dad Absolutely. 20 years ago, if Absolutely. I'm not mistaken. The first charter school in New Jersey. By the way, let's talk about that, the discussion of charter schools. Mm -hmm. Charter schools are public charter schools, but the biggest difference would be from them and the traditional public I schools. I would say the, the biggest difference is possibly in the diversity of the students. And one of the things, and what I was trying to express in that, in that forum is that we need to stop focusing on the what, like the public charter schools, the traditional public schools, the magnet schools, and we need to focus on what works and why it works. Can that really be working in traditional public schools? That's still out. What We're works? What works is quality education, performance-based evaluations, teachers that are, that are uh, evaluated based on performance, principals that are leaders, instructional leaders of schools, but also managers and a leader and understand the culture. That's what works. Is that harder in your mind to achieve in a traditional public school versus a charter school? I, I want to say that what charter schools, if, if charter schools have taught us anything. Because not all charter schools have succeeded. Absolutely not. Some have failed been put out of business, right. and not done well for those kids. And some have done selective process in terms of, and I think that happened earlier in, in the idea of what a charter school was. You mean like cherry picking kids? Absolutely, but now that's really, it's a, it's a, it's a misnomer for lack of a better word. It's because in Newark right now, we do have universal enrollment. Explain and what, what that means. Universal enrollment for lack is basically that everyone has to go through a process of a parent has the right to choose their school. And it may not be their neighborhood school. In fact, most parents don't choose their neighborhood schools. And overwhelmingly, parents are choosing either magnet schools or charter schools or public charter schools. Um, and I am not here in any way to say that Nork, traditional Nork public schools um, are, are absolutely having more challenges because we become more of the comprehensive schools. And that's really what Newark is, Newark Public Schools. That's what I'm used to. You, you take everyone um, where they're at and you teach where they're at. And we have to look not at- Not easy. It's, to, it's not charter easy. Charter schools but it's by themselves not the answer, are they? Absolutely not. But charter schools, again, have shown us that now there's close to, I think, 30% of children in Newark attend public charter schools, and many of them are excelling. So again, it's taught us something it's along, part with of our the solution. Uh, along with our magnet schools. That magnet schools are schools that children go to that focus yeah. on a particular area of concentration, right. if I'm not mistaken. And what it's, what it's proven is that children can perform better, that do go off to college, and can be prepared. You're and, finally, you're optimistic, aren't you? I am, but I want to take a pause. And I want us to remember how we got here. Excessive spending. Uh, teachers and uh, schools that did not live up to children's expectations. We need to live up to the child and the family's expectations. Real quick before I let you go, uh, local control will also mean Newark will pick its next superintendent. Absolutely. Uh, that matters because? It matters because this superintendent is key to the success of the continuing success of what's happening right now in Newark Public Schools. We are succeeding marginally, we're working, but it's going up. And, and that person has to understand that. 
and has to be part of this culture, um, this school system, and that person's going to get a lot farther. We don't need to start again. We can't start again. National search? I don't think so. I think we've got plenty of talent right here in New York Public Schools. Michelle Adubato, um, thank you not just for this interview, for that forum, but for um, being part of the solution. I can say that with all objectivity. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Steve Adubato here. Uh, Talking about the future of urban education, we're based here at the North Ward Center, a community-based organization here in the city. We just finished an extraordinary forum, a very candid forum that the gentleman you're about to see on camera, you've seen him before with us. He is Chris Cerf, the superintendent of the Newark Public Schools, the former head of the State Department of Education, the commissioner. Um, a very candid conversation about not just Newark schools, not just urban schools in New Jersey, but across the country. What was your biggest takeaway? Well, my biggest takeaway is that uh, we owe a debt uh, to our children, and uh, to pay that debt fully, we have to accept certain basic truths. And one of those truths is that um, in urban America, um, we have not succeeded as a country to provide the central uh, goal of public education, which is to give every child, regardless of the circumstances into which she or he is born, uh, an equal opportunity at a full and successful life. You know, Chris, you and I have had so many conversations about education, both on camera and as neighbors uh, in town as well in, in Montclair. We've talked about this. And, and, and so I'm going to put this question to you here, which we talked about there, which is a larger question of who cares, meaning I asked the question about suburban parents. And I don't mean they're a monolithic, monolithic entity, but the amount of state funding that goes to poorer districts is somewhat predicated on the will the political will of suburban legislators representing suburban taxpayers, parents, voters. Long-winded question, I know. To what degree do you believe others outside the city care about urban education and those kids? I think the answer is it very much depends. I think that there is a narrative out there that says that uh, we do not owe an obligation equally to all children. We need to keep our local taxes local to support our own schools. And why should Our taxes are already through the roof our taxes are already through the roof. But I have to tell you that I think when people sit down and really understand the question, they come out very differently. Because? Uh, they come out very differently because um, it's very difficult to defend a system where the quality of one school depends on the value of the taxable property alone. Explain There's, that to folks. Well, here's what I mean. I mean, in the olden days, uh, local property taxes essentially paid uh, the lion's share of the cost of public so education. So you got a lot of uh, uh, real estate in that town that's worth a lot. What does it say about the school district? Uh, they got more money to spend, and it all goes there, and none of it goes to a district that has, that, that has less. On the other hand, um, Years ago, uh, this country woke up to the idea that um, it can't be right that a child should go to a dilapidated, rundown school, have a larger class size, have no books, no computers, just because he or she happened to be born in a community with lower taxes. Now, the question that is fairly well, asked, I mean, less ability to fund the schools is what correct. you mean. Go ahead. Less ability to fund the schools, and so what the state now does is it expects every jurisdiction to pay what's called in the statute local fair share. It's a judgment about how much the people of that district can afford to spend. And then it tops it off with a slug of state money so that everybody ends up with roughly the same amount of money. Obviously, children who have greater needs, special education uh, students, uh, children who uh, go to schools with a high concentration of poverty get a little bit more. What are some of the keys, dare I call them best practices, in any urban school or school district anywhere in the state or nation? So uh, the by far and away, the most important variable within a school, within the four brick walls of a school, are the uh, effectiveness and quality of the, of the teaching force. Um, there's no question about that. Now, obviously, there are things outside the school that are highly relevant as well. But within a school, it's the quality of, of the teachers. And we do not have a system in this country um, that puts that value at the absolute top of the heap. For example, uh, we cannot differentiate pay. We cannot pay more for a PhD uh, uh, chemist uh, to come in and teach chemistry 
than for a teacher for whom there's a far greater supply uh, 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 of teachers. So that's a big fundamental problem. The second is leadership. Never seen a great school without a great leader. Principal. A uh, principal, correct. I've certainly seen some schools that are struggling that have a great principal, but I've never seen a truly great school without a great leader. The third, and this is a sort of softer one, Steve, but one that I think is very important, is you absolutely have to operate on the basis of high expectations for kids. Instead of saying, sorry for interrupting, Chris, you know what, what do you expect? They're kids in urban areas, they come from, from a tough community where crime is rampant, drugs are there, uh, there may or may not be two parents in the house. Well, come on, what do you expect? Uh, by the way, clearly I'm not saying that I think that, but some do. What do you well, expect? You I, expect what? I'm, I'm so glad you said that. I know it's not something from your heart, it's something you're attributing to others, but that sentiment, I believe, is very, very prevalent in it, public it's education. It's pervasive. It is. It is. And unless you have a school community and a school culture that accurately perceives that children, regardless of their poverty level, for example, or their home circumstances, for example, can and do every day soar if we give them an opportunity, then that's not going to happen for those kids. You, if you don't expect that they will be great, they won't be the great. Love to the level of expectation? Correct. You believe that? I absolutely do believe that. Now, look, we're not all born equal. I can tell you, for example, I don't have any musical ability whatsoever. Uh, and other people have great musical ability. Some people are born with profound intelligence and some people with less so. So I'm not saying that everybody is born equal. What, but, could, what, what should we be able, what should we realistically, legitimately, Chris, expect for most students in urban schools across this nation? Every child should go to school from pre-K or at least kindergarten through 12th grade, should graduate with a diploma, and that diploma should mean something. It should demonstrate that that child is ready for either college level work or for mm. access to a profession that provides the kind of economic opportunity that everybody in this country deserves. Chris, in the limited time we have left, uh, you are leaving as the superintendent of the North Public Schools. In the middle of 2018, this program will be seen in 18. The state has controlled the North Public Schools for over 20 years. Local control is happening, meaning the city of Newark is, will be in control of its own destiny in the public schools. Reason for optimism? Well, I have a lot of reason for optimism, in part because, and I know there are a lot of uh, narrative out there, because over the course of the last eight years, um, the gains in graduation rates, in math achievement, in reading achievement, and frankly, the systems that support that, the ability to hire, recruit, and retain great teachers, how we compensate teachers, just the data systems, the technology, has led to very significant advances, outsized advances compared to other cities in the country. We have a foundation upon which to build. We have a board that is committed. Board of Education. Board of Education that is going to run this billion dollar a year enterprise. Um, they are committed, they are trained. Um, if we can assure that they keep their eye on the ball here, and the ball is very simply, mm. this system does not exist for any other reason than to successfully educate children. It's not about contracts, it's not about jobs, it's, it's not about patronage. It's not about patronage. It's not about scratching uh, people's back for political favors. What school do I get to? What job does my cousin get? As long as they keep their eye on the ball, um, we will go to a really terrific place in this city. Thank you, Chris, sir. Well done. Thank you. My pleasure. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to be joined by Sarah Kay, Director of Corporate Giving at Prudential Financial. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. You know, there are a group of people, I believe we have nine experts, nine people committed to urban education all across this state, this nation. Prudential Financial committed to urban education, particularly in Newark, because? 
Well, Prudential headquarters is here in Newark, New Jersey. We were founded over 140 years ago to really ensure that everybody has the opportunity to achieve financial security. And that opportunity begins with making sure that people have the right skill sets and that they're connected to quality jobs. And that begins with having a high quality education. And so for us, we strongly believe that um, a high quality education system is really important for a thriving city of which we believe that Newark will become. Um, it's also very important that it helps create pathways for economic mobility for underserved populations. For for example, um, a high-quality education could set them on the right pathway to get into a really good college or a really good career, whichever they choose to do, if they have the right fundamental basic skill sets that they learned in the K-12 through education. Um, and it's inextricably a tie to making sure that this nation has a skilled workforce. So at the core of it, we are a business, and we want to make sure that we have the future workforce right. here in our headquarters cities of Newark, but also um, for these young residents to be able to go out wherever they want to go to in whatever location. So let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. What do you think some of the most significant challenges that urban students face really are? There are so many different challenges, like you mentioned, in terms of what urban students face. Um, here in Newark, you know, people live in different neighborhoods where their income level is very different in addition to the types of resources and support. So even though it's so important that within the school building that there's good teachers, good principals, good curriculum, good uh, community resources like arts education and sports, but at the same time, so much of what impacts a student is also outside of the school building. Such so what's right. happening at home, if they have food on their table, if they have safe passageways to the school building, do they have a good support network, whether it be their friends or their teachers or peers? And so there's so many different types of challenges that urban communities face because oftentimes many students are in a one-family home or they don't have their parents at home. They don't have a support system to help them with their homework. Um, you know, I think in this day and age, especially in urban communities, we task our teachers and principals with a lot of responsibility of being the parent, the teacher, the friend, the supporter. Is it different? Excuse me for interrupting. Mm -hmm. You know, we're only a few miles away. We're taping in Newark, New Jersey. And I don't want to point out any other communities, but say it's Short Hills, mm -hmm. uh, a particularly wealthy suburban community. Do you think we ask more of principals, teachers, educational administrators, people who deal in directly with urban students, whether it's New York, Jersey City, Camden, et cetera. Do you think we ask more of them than we ask of others? It's not that we personally ask more it's of them. It's more expected. It's more, it's not, and again, it's not the expectations, but the teachers and the principals, they actually do more than the teachers and the principals in uh, some of the suburban areas, just simply because of the nature of the community of where these students are coming from. The needs from. are greater. The needs are so much greater. Uh, like I said, especially if they have um, only one family member at home sure. who is working a uh, day job and a night job, they don't have that support system to help with their homework. Yeah. I mean, even in my friends that live in suburban communities, and they're trying to make that decision as to whether or not to send their child to a public school or private school, I always tell them the biggest difference is the resources that are at home that makes a difference. Every public school teacher does their best, whether they're in the urban education or in the suburban area, but then there's so much more that the child faces in terms of challenges that can help be help addressed at the home. And if they just don't have that stable home environment or they just don't have the resources there, then there is that difference that teachers end up doing more. Sarah, help us understand something. At Prudential Financial, there's also a foundation very committed to the Prudential Foundation. Give me a couple of examples of exactly what Prudential is doing to help Newark school children and Newark schools. I can give you a couple of different ways. The ones that jump uh, out, by the way, go on their website. We'll put it up yeah. to find out more. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for that pitch. Um, we have a lot of investments that we made financially. We support every superintendent that has come in to help run this school district. We've worked with the parents. Um, for example, we support an organization, the Newark Trust for Education, that's really based on community members getting their input and really helping to understand what it means for the city to return local control. At the same time, we've made impact investments in creating uh, cohesive communities, whether it be around charter school financing, Teachers Village. We were one of the leaders in that in providing financial investments. We invested over $65 million in that, but also really thought leadership in partnering with Ron Bates Group and then the architect. The developer. The developer. Um, and just thinking about this concept of what does it mean to build this corridor where there are schools, there's teacher housing that's subsidized and that there's retail space available. And so they don't necessarily feel like they are lacking in the resources and support. So we have a health clinic that's available there. We have a daycare center as well, too. And so it's really making sure that the teachers feel like they have the resources to be successful. Do you think most Americans who do not live in urban areas understand the challenges that 
teachers as well as students and administrators in urban areas like Newark face? And does that matter? I think there are differences of opinions. I think some people who may either have grown up in the urban area or um, have work experience or personal experience in urban areas are a little bit more familiar with the challenges. Sure. I would say broadly, though, probably pe people misunderstand the challenges that students face in urban communities. Yeah, hey, Just, why can't they get their test scores up? Exactly. Or why can't they finish their homework? Or what's going on with the teachers? My kid does. Exactly. And it's really about. I mean that. I, I don't mean that because <laughs> ours don't very often. But, but right. Yes. And it's about the support systems that are really um, necessary for a student to be successful. And that support system is like, it's like a whole orchestra. You need every single player to be there and it has to take everything from the teacher, the principal, the coaches, if they're part of sports teams, the after school communicator. The corporate community. The corporate community, um, public agencies, you know, the city office, all of these um, individuals. Uh, that saying, it takes a village to raise a child is even more true when yeah. you're in an urban community. Well, listen, um, Sarah Kay, who's the Director of Corporate Giving at Prudential Financial. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by New Jersey Resources, Berkeley College, United Airlines, Hackensack Meridian Health, The Fidelco Group, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, and by NJM Insurance Group. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. I'm Taiwan Join, Berkeley College, Class of 2011, Assistant General Manager, Vera Wang. Kate Hickey, Class of 2006, Project Manager at Tricarico Architecture and Design. Sal Frasina, Class of 2009, Chief Construction Inspector, Con Edison. Tracy Mondale, Class of 2010, Sales Space Manager, PepsiCo. From different walks of life, our students succeed in different ways. Yet their first step is exactly the same, Berkeley College.